Uh, so today I'm excited because I get to finally finish up a series. And if, if you're watching, we have a lot of people who watch our services, uh, like after the fact, they watch these messages on podcast or video where they watch them later on. And you're just rolling through the series. You're just going to watch week four and then go right to week five. And you're like, yeah, next week. It's been three months between week four and week five. Three months. I had a kid. We did Hope Week. Tons of crazy stuff has happened in between. But I wanted to make sure to finish this series because I really do think it is important. So today we get to wrap it up. This is a five-part series we did because it is a five-partisan, five chapters through the book of 1 Peter, this series, Life as a Foreigner. The writer of this book, of course, is Peter, just to recap with you. Uh, in the Bible, he's known as Simon, he's known as Cephas, and he's known as Peter, same guy. And Peter is a fascinating character. When we look at Peter's journey with Jesus, he became one of the disciples who walked with Jesus He's one of these guys who was like, man, he was all over the place spiritually. Like Peter was this guy who like, you know, he declared like, Jesus, you're the son of God. And he's like, that's amazing. And then like a little while later, he's like arguing with everyone. Like, I think I'm going to be the most important disciple. And Jesus is like, man, you're missing it, right? I mean, he's like the guy, literally one time, Jesus, he gives him the name Peter, which means like a stone. He's like, you're like this, this foundational leader in our church. And then a little while later, Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. No one wants to get called Satan by Jesus. That's a bad scenario, right? And he actually got that in his life. He's the guy that we read a story about getting out of a boat and walking on water, miraculous faith. Yet at the end of his life, he denied Jesus three times. One time even to like a little girl who asked like, you with Jesus? And he's like, I don't know anything about this guy. That he was terrified in that moment. He's kind of this back and forth character. It's interesting because he actually found Jesus because of his brother Andrew. They were both fishermen. Andrew was actually probably a little more spiritual than Peter. He was following a guy named John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist said, we think this guy is the Messiah, he ran and got his brother Peter, said, you got to come meet this guy, Jesus. Jesus comes back around and he actually teaches out of Peter's boat one time and then says, come follow me. You're going to stop fishing for fish. You're going to start fishing for people. And he invites him to be one of these disciples. In fact, Andrew, Peter, James, and John were four guys that fished together. I mean, blue-collar dudes, that's literally like the first third of the disciples were four guys who fished together, which I just always think is fascinating to think about. After Jesus' death, Peter became um, a strong leader in the church. Right after uh, the day of Pentecost, when like the Spirit of God fell... Peter was the guy who grabbed the mic and stepped up and preached the first message. It was obvious that he was a leader inside of their ranks. There were actually three big leaders, James, Peter, and Paul. James was the brother of Jesus. He was a leader in Jerusalem. Uh, Paul was known as like the apostle to the Gentiles, and Peter was known as the apostle to the Jewish people. He really focused a lot on Jewish people becoming Christians. And in AD 63, he wrote this letter. He wrote it to churches, AD 63, so 30 years after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection. We have years of him planning churches, leading. He writes this letter to the people. It's kind of at the end of his life. And at that time, the gospel had spread all the way through this area, all the way to Rome. And these people were a, a decent distance away from where he was at. And he wrote to encourage the church, and it's where we actually get the name for this series. In 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he says this. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the province of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, very often when we think about the idea of being a foreigner, he says you're living as foreigners in these provinces. We think about someone moving from one culture into a culture that's not their own, and that's what makes them a foreigner. That's not what had happened to these people. This was their hometowns. This was their region. They didn't move to somewhere else, and that's what made them foreigners. They had stayed rooted, but the world had moved around them. The Roman culture had swept through this area. There was this fascinating season that happened right now called the Pax Romana, where the Roman Empire just basically swept up community after community after region after region. They pulled them underneath of what they called the Pax Romana, which was Roman peace, and said, no more of this little fighting between each other. We're all on the same page. We all have to get along because now you're all part of Rome. 
and it changed the culture drastically. Not only that, but these people became Jesus followers. So now they didn't even really fit into their Jewish culture as well. And he says, you kind of feel like you don't fit in anymore where you're sitting at. You feel like a foreigner living in a country that you don't belong. Now, I know this is really hard to imagine, but to take you back, I said this on week one, okay, with the Roman culture sweeping through. Try to picture this. I know it's difficult. Picture a culture that is quickly shifting and changing with very fluid and progressive views on stuff like philosophy, sex, gender, drug use, and entertainment that views Christianity as a possible threat to progressing forward as a culture. I know that's really hard to imagine, right? Like, no, that's, that's literally, we're just doing Rome 2.0 in the United States of America right now. It's like, that's literally our culture right now in our community. And they were experiencing this same tension. So for some of you, who maybe in recent years, you've been feeling this, this tension, it's very, very important for you to understand how can you live as a foreigner. This message was timely, okay? First of all, literally the next year in AD 64, there was a giant fire and persecution swept across the area, and he was definitely getting them prepped. But at the same time, this message is timeless. Christians throughout the last 2,000 years, in whatever culture they exist, in whatever community they exist, they often feel as though they don't fit into the general population around them. And that is how it's always been and is always meant to be. If you felt like you don't fit in, this might be helpful to you. So quick recap, and then we'll jump forward, okay? We literally are going chapter by chapter through this book, First Peter. You can read it. You can go back and watch it if you didn't see these. But week one, Peter directs us to the idea that as Christians, even though we feel like foreigners, we're meant to live every day with the joy of eternity in our mind. It's the idea that we say we're not citizens here, but we do have a citizenship, it's just in heaven. And because we have citizenship in heaven, we can be truly glad even when circumstances are bad in our here and now because we're just temporary residents. This isn't the focus of our life. In fact, our citizenship is in heaven. We're going to go to heaven and we're going to be there eternally with God. So right now we can be truly glad even though it's difficult. Week two, Peter breaks out for us that for us as Christians, we're meant to be separated from the world, but we aren't meant to be isolated from it. We are meant to be separated. That means set apart, different, holy. That we don't take our cues in regards to what's right and wrong by general opinion. That's how culture naturally does. Is Whatever the most people agree on, that's kind of culture's decision on what's right or wrong. But as Christians, we don't do that. We take our cues on what's right or wrong, what's beneficial from what God's word says. And that will often be in disagreement with what the general culture believes. So he says, you're meant to be separated from them with a different set of standards. But... You're not meant to be isolated. Isolated means you would be removed from that culture. He says, actually, I need you to be different while still staying inside of it. Because you're meant to be light inside of darkness. You're meant to be different, but you're meant to be there. I jokingly said that's why some of you are still in Illinois, even though you wanted to run. You're meant to be separated, but not isolated. In week three, he got personal. He talked about how it's not just culture at large. There are people who know you who are going to treat you like foreigners, your friends, your family, your co-workers, and they're going to treat you different because you are different. But that can be difficult when it's someone who you love, someone who's close to you. What about when it's someone in your family? What about when it's someone you care about? And what do we do in response to when people treat us differently, maybe abuse us in some way because of our faith? And he pointed us to the idea that for us as Christians, we do what's good and we don't worry about the rest. But despite the circumstances or the consequences, we don't even treat people the way that they deserve. We treat people the way Jesus tells us to. We do what's good despite whatever else is going on. And then in week four, he talked about how you need to be ready for this. Because people then and people now who have our faith, who feel like they don't fit in, They'll receive attacks from the world around them and they'll wonder if something is wrong with their faith. And Peter says, listen, don't be surprised by suffering. That's actually part of following Jesus. People say, am I doing something wrong? I'm experiencing suffering. And he says, no, suffering has always been part of following Jesus. In fact, I told you, a good theology on suffering will keep you from bad theology. 
If you understand the fact that suffering is actually part of following Jesus, that none of us get away from that, all of us have to suffer in some form or another and then find how to glorify God inside of that, it will keep you away from false theology where people are like, yeah, but if this hurts, God would want me to change it. Or, oh, if this makes me happy, God would want me to pursue it. Or if this is hard, God would want me to not have to deal with it. And it's like that has nothing to do with biblical Christianity at all. This week, he's going to wrap up this letter. And he wraps up this letter with a warning, actually. He takes their eyes and he turns them to this picture in 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11. Chapter 5, he says this. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God has called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Jesus Christ. So after you've suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. He says, it's not just that you live in a culture that you don't fit into. There's a real spiritual enemy out there called the devil. And he uses a picture in this culture at this time, a lion to be about the biggest, scariest animal that would exist where these people were from. And he goes, you know, just like a lion, I mean, it's big enough. If it wants to eat you, it can eat you, right? He's like, that's like what the devil is. He's prowling around like a man-eater looking for someone to devour. He says, now, good news is this. God's got you. If you stay close to him, right, God's going to restore you. He's going to take you through this. But what is kind of a surprising little like antidote or salve to the the situation of living as a foreigner and having an enemy that's attacking you, I think is verse 9. He says, there's this enemy who's trying to attack you. And he says this, remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. It's interesting because he says, you know, you don't fit in. And the devil wants to destroy you. But he kind of says this, you know, you might be suffering, but you're not suffering alone. You might be in a hard season, but you're not an island. You might feel like you don't fit in, but there are people all over the world with your same faith that feel the exact same way. In fact, if I may, the whole last chapter of 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, is all about how if we are going to live As a foreigner, we absolutely need the local church. Let me say it this way, okay? To condense this all down into a sentence you can carry. As Christians, the world's culture is not your community. If you're a Jesus follower, the world's culture around us isn't our community. So you need a church who is your community. You need a church who is your community. You aren't meant to fit into this culture, but you also aren't meant to be alone. And this has happened throughout the world, throughout history, okay? All around the world, in big cities, where there are multiple different populations, all throughout history, what happens is people naturally clump together when they have similar views, when they have similar standards, when they have similar lifestyles. You can see it all over the world in these tiny little enclaves. They actually call them ethnic enclaves. The closest one to us is you can literally just drive to Chicago about an hour away. And in 1912, an enclave uh, started to form there that's called Chinatown. It's still there 110 years later. And when the immigrants started coming into Chicago and they felt like we were foreigners in a culture, they didn't spread out all over the community. They gathered together so that they could encourage each other. They gathered together so they could support each other because they realized we're foreigners in this culture. And literally 110 years later, this is fascinating to me, still over a third of the Chinese Chicagoans who live in Chicago live right there inside of Chinatown. Still to this day, a third of them live right there compacted together where they can support and encourage each other. When you don't fit into a culture, you need to find your community because you can't find it in the world. And this is what he's talking about for us who feel like foreigners. You need a church. Now, 
Of course, he's talking about the universal church, right? That would be like what I would call the big C church. It's where you capitalize the C at the beginning of church, meaning everyone who follows after Jesus, everyone who's put their trust in him all around the world. I mean, he literally says that in verse 9, the family of believers all around the world. Basically saying everywhere you go, there are people who are suffering just like you. That encourages you. He even says in 1 Peter 5, 13, at the end of this, he says, your sister church here in Babylon sends you greeting. And so so does my son Mark, basically saying there's a church all the way over here where I'm at, and they're experiencing the same thing. They're praying for you, believing that God's going to work on your behalf just like he is for them. And this gives you this idea that you have a culture. Because when you feel like a foreigner, sometimes what you feel like is everyone else is part of this culture and we have none. He says, no, 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 you have a culture. The church exists and you fit in with these people. But even more powerful than just being part of the church in general is finding your local connection to a local church. This is what Peter steers into in chapter 5. He steers into coaching the local church. He actually speaks to people who are pastors and elders. He speaks to people who are followers in the church of how they can be part of this church in a beneficial way. Here's what he says in 1 Peter 5.5. 5. In the same way, you who are younger, and when he says younger, it doesn't just mean by age, it really means by faith, like you're younger in your faith. He says, you must accept the authority of the elders. That would be like a pastor in the community. And all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Remember this, okay? As Christians, the world's culture is in our community. So you need a church. And he says the benefit of this church is, is twofold. One is that you actually have a spiritual leader who is ahead of you. Somebody who you believe has lived more spiritual life than you. It could be that they're older. They could be younger. But you feel as though they've lived a spiritual life that's worth emulating. And they're drawing you farther down the path. And not only that, but then the second part is... You're then surrounded by people who share your faith to be able to walk through this journey with you. This is critical for us as Christians. Now let's talk about these two different pieces, those who are elders ahead and those who are around us in this and why it's beneficial in both ways. The first is really this, <clears throat> excuse me, this mindset of an elder or a pastor. And this picture is that you're supposed to have this pastor who is ahead of you, a spiritual leader that you follow after. Now, when we read these verses in just a second, it has way more application to me as a pastor as far as coaching the attitude or um, how I should lead. But what you can draw from this is twofold. One, it's that you're supposed to have a spiritual authority in your life. Christians in America do not like this. Our American individualistic culture is like, I got this on my own. I'm just, I'll take care of me. I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on my own faith. I'm just good on my own. Where other cultures, maybe this is more common, but in our American culture, when I tell you, you should have like a pastor who's ahead of you. You should have like a spiritual leader that you give some authority to in your life. A bunch of us are like, I don't know about that, right? But it's absolutely biblical, in fact, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 13, 7, right? Completely different book written by a completely different author who was trying to encourage the church. Here's what he says. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are spiritually accountable to God. This is why very often sometimes people be like, I think I want to be a pastor. I'm like, I don't think you do. It's not fun. There's a tremendous amount of weight on your shoulders. Do you read that? He's like, people who are going to be pastors, they're supposed to look out for your souls. I can tell you the amount of weight sometimes it feels crushing of being concerned for people's, not like lives, not like performance, eternal souls. And he's like, there are these people who are crazy enough, willing enough to leverage their life to trying to draw you into a relationship with God to try to lead you towards what's right spiritually. And he says, listen to them when they speak into your life. Give authority to them into your life. Open your life so they can see your life and they can call out things that are bad or things that are good and speak into it. 
He actually finishes this by saying this, Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be to your benefit. He's basically like, dude, it's a hard job. Be nice, right? That's what he's saying, right? He's like, Pastor, it's a hard job. Be nice to the people who are crazy enough to do this for you. But this whole section points to the idea that we as Jesus followers, if we're going to be, live this life as a foreigner, we're meant to have someone who's ahead of us on this journey that's, that's speaking into our life, to have a spiritual authority over us. In fact, here's what it says in 1 Peter 5, 2-4. through 4. This is speaking to pastors, and he's kind of saying, I'm an elder, you're an elder. Here's how you should pastor in your local church. And although I said this is going to be more applicable for how I should live my life as a pastor than maybe you who are spiritual followers, here's what's cool. You can use this to determine whether or not you want to follow somebody. If they don't fit into these markers, you shouldn't follow them. Here's what he says. 1 Peter 5, 2-4, through 4, Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you can get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, and that's Jesus Christ, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. The picture they give is that being a pastor is kind of like being a shepherd. Like you have a whole bunch of sheep, and your job is to try to keep these sheep safe, to guard them and, and direct them in the right direction. And although that's an encouragement for me of how I should pastor, you can look at those three pictures. He gives three pictures of what a pastor should be and shouldn't be. And you can use that to determine if the person you're looking to as a spiritual authority is the right person or not. Here's what he says, okay? To be a pastor who's in the right, the right lane, he says, you should pastor willingly, not grudgingly. This means that a pastor should be joyful to lead people should want to care for them, should want to help them. They have a concern. Not a pastor who is angry or frustrated or like always aggressive and like, man, mad at the people who they would lead. He says that the pastor should do it for service, not for money. That pastors should be hard workers. Pastors should be people who are not just in love with the results. They're in love with the work. They're willing to put in the time because their goal is really to serve Jesus in this. Not somebody who's just trying to collect a paycheck. He says if you find a pastor who's lazy, right? They're just kind of putting in the bare minimum to be able to cash the check. He says if they're just doing it for money, that's not a good spiritual leader. And he says this, as a godly example, not lording it above the church. This is a picture that a pastor should, of course, be a godly example, should have a life that you want to emulate in some way, a life of discipline. But at the same time, they're meant to be with their people. They're meant to be sinners who show how they're moving forward in grace. They are not meant to be the hero of the church. Jesus is the hero of the church. The pastors are not meant to be some sort of like super spiritual, like they walk in in a cloud and no one can touch them. You wouldn't understand I'm a pastor. He says, that's absolutely right wrong. You're not supposed to lord it over people. You're supposed to be right there with your flock. You can use these criteria to be able to figure out, is this person the person who I want to put in spiritual authority above me? If that interests you, you're like a note taker, right? Real quick. You can read 2 Peter 2, where in the next letter he wrote, he says, let me specifically spell out who's not a good pastor to follow. You can write, read Titus chapter 1, where Paul ends up speaking to Titus because he left him and said, now you need to pick pastors. And he says, let me tell you what they'll look like when you find them. And you can read 1 Timothy 3, where he writes to Timothy and says, make sure these qualifications are continually met by those who are going to be elders and overseers, those who are going to be pastors. But the big thing that you can take from this is this, that for you as a Christian, if you're going to live this life as a foreigner, you're meant to actually humble yourself and put yourself under some sense of spiritual authority. You're meant to find a pastor in the local church who can help lead you and draw you to become more like Jesus. That's one of the benefits. The second is the people who are around us, the congregation or the community that's around us inside of the church. It's not just about the elder, the idea of you need to find a good pastor or teacher. He also says in that same verse 5, all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. 
For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, here's one thing we can take away from this really easily. He says, dress yourself in humility as you relate to one another. Here's what that apply, implies. Excuse me. There's going to be a one another. It's specifically that in your faith, he's like, you're going to live your faith with other people. It's assumed. I need you to get this. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. That's not the idea. Like, I know we have this individualistic where it's like, well, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. Absolutely you do. But your faith is never meant to be a private relationship with Jesus. We're actually always meant to be part of a community where we share our faith there. And he says, you need to dress yourself in humility as you work with the church that's around you. There's actually a bad habit that's going on right now specifically kind of like on the back of COVID and all this, where people will say like, oh, well, you know, like I'm just the church. I don't need to go and be part of a church. I don't need to go and do that. You know, like I'm just the church wherever I am. And when I hear that, I'm like, false. Like literally, actually, definitionally false. Church is plural. You can't be church on your own. You can be part of the church. You can celebrate the things that church celebrate. You can take the mission of the church with you. You cannot be church on your own. Church is specifically the plural of Christians coming together. It is the gathering and the interaction of the believers, and it is mandated by God that it's critical that we share our life with each other. Get this. I need you to see this. God institutes that our Christian faith is never a lone faith. It is always meant to be lived out in community. In fact, in this same book, just in chapter 4, right before this, I didn't get to read this to you in chapter 4. Not like any of you would remember three months ago anyway, right? But here's what he says in 1 Peter 4, 7 through 10. He says this, The end of the world is coming soon. Some of you guys just found your verse for the next year, right? Some of you guys got ammo stockpiled, you got food stockpiled, and you're like, I finally have my verse. When someone says you're crazy, I'm like, First Peter 4, 7, end of the world's coming soon. Anyways, um, I have some food set aside too, so don't worry, you're not crazy if that's the case. Uh, it says, the end of the world is coming soon, therefore, okay, so you're like, this is important. He says, like, the end is coming soon, because surely it is, even if we're like, hey, the end isn't, I thought in 2020 it was going to end, we'll all be dead in like five minutes anyway, right? Life goes so fast, the end is always coming soon. He says, therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. And we would think, yeah, that makes sense. The end is coming soon. So focus in on praying to God. Focus in on communicating to God. But look at what the next line is. Most important of all. And that should strike you. He says, the end of the world is coming soon. Be focused in on prayer. And then he says, but most important of all, which we'd say, okay, now wait a second then. Let's listen. Continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. In light of the idea the world might be coming to a close soon, he says, most important of all, make sure you're part of a community. Make sure your life is open where you share meals with people and you share love with people because it seems to do something good for all that sin that you're struggling with in your life. And in fact, you might not have caught it there, but that last verse in there is one of my favorites. He says that God has given us a, each a spiritual gift. Every single one of you, God has given a spiritual gift to. But maybe you didn't notice it as he read it. He said it wasn't the idea that God gave you a spiritual gift to serve yourself, he specifically says that God has given you a spiritual gift and says, use them well to serve one another. Here's how amazing our God is. He specifically instituted our faith to be a community-based faith. And when he gave you spiritual gifts, he didn't give you the ones you need. He gave you the gifts someone else needed. And the gifts that you need he gave to someone else inside of your church. You see that God specifically doled them out so we would need each other in community. I liken it to this, a, a parable. 
A dad had three young boys. They always fought, never got along, would never play together, always fight. So he come home one day and he says, I got presents for all of you. He's got three presents sitting there all like, yeah. And the first kid opens the present and it's an RC car. It's amazing, right? Big, huge tires, right? Monster truck. This is going to be epic. He's like, yes. Second son opens up his present and it's the remote control for that RC car. Third kid opens up his present. It's the batteries for the RC car and for the remote control. Bad dad or good dad? Good dad. He knew that these kids, if, if you're going to enjoy what I've bought for you, you're going to have to do it together. None of you are going to experience the joy of your presence apart. But if you're willing to work together, you can have tons of fun. And this is exactly what God did with us, where he gave us all gifts. But listen, he gave us, us gifts to serve one another, that we're meant to be in community to serve one another. I need you to get this, okay? Because we, we mess up what church means, okay? And, and especially on the back of COVID, really interesting, I read a study recently. They said that when, when churches uh, closed up, right, and people moved out of the church, and even if they didn't close, people still moved out of the church for a season, and people went online. Now what they've found is basically that the churches have been, have been split in three. One third, on average, came back to the churches they were part of, okay? And we actually saw way more than that in regards to it. The second third of Christians, what they did is they just stayed online. Uh, very often, they didn't just watch their church online. What often happened is because they're online watching church, even as much as we were, I don't know if you guys were on with us last week for our online experience, your, your local church most likely doesn't have the same capabilities as these mega churches that produce online content constantly. So a lot of people actually said, oh, I'm just online. So if I'm online, I'm going to be part of Elevation Church or Life Church or these, the best teachers in the world, the best worship in the world. I'm just going to do church that way. And then about a third of them never came back. They disappeared. The devil got them. The lion captured those people. And we pray someday, of course, the Lord will bring them back. But I need to speak to this for a second because I need you to be really clear on this. You simply watching a message online. You simply watching a, a, a service online is not church. It's not church. We're glad that we can do that to connect people when they're not here, but that's not church. You simply coming, even if you do come, let me be clear about this. You think, well, no, I, I don't watch. I come. You coming here and, and walking in and sitting down and hearing a message and then getting up and running out and not knowing anybody, not serving in any way, not being part in any way, you just walk in, sit down, hear the message, get up, run out, that's not church. That's not church either. You think, oh, I'm, I'm part of the church. You're not. I need you to get this, okay? Church takes humility. This is specifically what he's saying. Dress yourselves in humility as you interact with one another. Real quick, if your church doesn't take humility, it's not church. Humility is the opposite of pride. Pride is all about you, serving you, your honor, your focus, building yourself up, taking care of yourself. Humility is where you spread out your concern beyond yourself to actually incorporate other people. Where you lessen the focus of it just being your glory and your focus, and instead you make yourselves part of something where you actually spread out and you know people and they know you, where you serve people and they serve you. Listen, if church doesn't take humility, it's not church. It's not church. You actually have to be known by people. You have to know people. You need to serve people and be served by people to actually be doing church. This is why it's really critical we get this in understanding. I think Peter, he probably spoke this because he likely remembers one of these lessons that Jesus taught him. 
where it was probably burned in his mind because it was so shocking. Uh, on the night that they celebrated Passover together, he comes in and Jesus is standing there. And he's got a basin of water and he's got a towel around his waist. And he says, sit down, men, and I'm going to wash your feet. And it literally says that Peter throws a hissy fit. He's like, you're not going to wash my feet, Jesus, right? Like, that's a servant's job and you're my teacher. And he really, you know, Peter like gets real bold in some of those moments, right? And Jesus is like, sit down, Peter, I'm going to wash your feet. Sure enough, he goes through and he washes the disciples' feet. And he says this in John 13, 12 through 15. Probably Peter's still reeling from watching who he believes is the Savior of the world wash his feet. He says this. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and he sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord and you're right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Peter remembers this moment where Jesus gets down and he humbles himself and he says, I need you to understand this. As you go forward from here and as you start the church, a key aspect of what church is is you serving others and letting them serve you. If you can't serve other people, if you can't use the spiritual gifts that God's given you in order to encourage someone else, you're not doing church right. Not only that, but real quick, if you're too proud to let somebody serve you, you're not doing church right. There's this aspect, right, where it's like, oh, well, I can just, I can take care of myself. I'll take care of all this. And he's like, that's not church, man. Church is about humility, it's about knowing someone and letting someone know you. It's about serving someone and letting someone serve you. That's church. This whole entire chapter is the picture of the necessity of this community. In fact, it's literally a really interesting picture because in chapter 5, it goes like this. There are pastors and they are shepherds. They're like a shepherd who watches over sheep. You're a sheep. And out here... There's a lion looking to devour you. It's this picture of like here you sit between shepherds and a community and that which wants to destroy you. And it's this pull to us of if you're going to survive, you need a shepherd. You need a flock. You know, the whole flock situation is so fascinating, isn't it? Because I watch all those animal shows with my kids and it makes no sense. Because, like, if a lion could catch a sheep, then wouldn't it just be easier to catch a sheep if they're in a big old ball? I mean, like, if there's a whole bunch of them together, you think, like, well, that's a bad strategy. Now they can just jump on that. It's easier to kill a sheep, right? You would think it'd be better if you guys were all spread out, right? But that's not how it works. You know why? Because when a lion or when a wolf or whenever uh, one comes to an attack a, a group animal... When they're all together in the group and they, they try to get into the herd, what happens is as they're running, that animal, that lion or that wolf keeps switching targets. This one, this one, this one, and their attention keeps getting darted between that one and then this one and then this one. And you know what happens? Since they can't focus on one, they don't catch any. Because their attention keeps getting switched to that, you know, that one and then that one and then that one and then that one. They can't just keep up with one and, and run it down. In fact, that's you know, literally what zebra stripes are. Zebra stripes aren't to blend into the grass. They're to blend into each other. When lions look at zebras, the stripes make them blend into each other so they can't pick a target. And he says, you're like a sheep and you need to be part of this herd because, listen, here's the enemy's plan for you, okay? That devil that's prowling around, I'll tell you what it is. It's really simple. His plan for you is pride, it's pride. It's for you to become proud. And it's so fascinating because that word, okay, pride and proud. You know, proud literally means to stand out. Like if you're sanding something and something stands out, they say it's proud. It stands out. And the devil's plan for you is pride. I need you to get this, okay? Pride is a bad word in the Bible. Did you know that? It's a bad word in the Bible. You can be confident, you can be competent, but you are not meant to be prideful. Prideful means you are about your own glory. Your energy is directed inward towards yourself and your focus is on you. You create and craft your own glory. 
And it's literally what the devil wants to do. He wants to get you to be so proud that you couldn't submit yourself under a leader. Somebody who's a shepherd who wants to call out those devils. He wants to get you so proud that you wouldn't want to be part of a community. You don't have time for that. Because if you stand out from all of that, sure enough, he can pick you off. Friends, this has always been the devil's tactic. It's always been the devil's strategy. I need you to get this just real quick to jump back and then we'll jump right back forward and we'll wrap this up. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 is a prophetic example of who Satan was. The, the writer was talking about who Satan was and what he's become. And listen how it says the foundation of who Satan is. It's all pride. He says, look, how you have fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You've been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high God. Satan's plan is always pride. I'm going to honor myself. In fact, when he comes to the very first people who are on earth, Adam and Eve, what does he do? He tempts them with pride. He says, you eat this and you will become like God. And all of our sin, friends, comes from pride. It's from us saying, I know better than God does. I'm the one in charge of everything. I'll take care of it. I'm the one who's in charge of this. And it all comes back to pride. And listen to me. The devil is running a great tactic with the church, with pride. We live as foreigners. We're not going to fit into this culture. If we do, we're going back to our old ways. But what the devil has been doing in the church, specifically in the American church for a long time, is he has been just focusing us in on pride. I say, you should find yourself a spiritual authority. And you go, I don't need no spiritual authority. It's just me and Jesus. I got this on my own. Besides, some of us would be like, you know, that sounds dangerous, Cameron. You know, there's spiritual authorities. They, they could take advantage of people. And you're like, yeah, absolutely. You know what's more dangerous? Not having any spiritual authority. Not saying there isn't the possibility of something going wrong here. Great part is God spoke really clearly so you can actually read Scripture and you can identify clearly who should and should not be your spiritual authority. He writes a lot about it. You just say run away from that situation because that's not a good spiritual authority. But you as somebody who has none, danger. So you should be part of a local church and the devil speaks to you. You're too important for that. You're too busy for that. You got too much to put on your list. You got too much to accomplish. You don't want to be going and spend You're going to have dinners with these weird people. Invite them to your house. Know about them. They know. You're going to let them know about your sins. Are you kidding me? No, absolutely not. I'm not doing all of that. And he just massages pride into us to be like, oh, I don't need that. And he makes us proud and pulls us away from that that shepherd that could be in our life, and that flock that could be where we could be protected. If he doesn't do that, just one more, that I've seen over and over and over again, he'll try to make it all about you. Even if you do decide you're going to be part of some church, you know what he'll do is he'll try to get the focus of you in church all on you. It's all about you. If you're just a brand new person who's like looking for a church, right? You're just, you barely have any faith and you're figuring this out. Don't let me think that I'm, I'm pushing on you here. But I just want to be offensive to a moment for somebody who says they are a Christian. They've been a Christian for a long time. They know Jesus. They understand Jesus. Okay. And if that's you and you've said these words, we're church shopping. Do me a favor. Take your right hand and slap yourself across the face because that's the devil speaking. We're church shopping. Do you know what shopping is? Shopping is comparing the value of something and finding what serves you best. That's fine in like a thousand different scenarios. But the idea that we would apply that to church is like, well, I'm just going around and checking out churches to see which one, you know, suits me best. And you're like, oh, so it's about you. Here this whole time, I thought church is about worshiping Jesus. It's about you. Oh, okay. And that's the devil's strategy to be like, oh, this is all about you. What serves you best? What fits you best? And I understand the vernacular. Some of you are like, I said that this morning. Uh-oh, what? Um, but you need to get this. I just need to reassess your, your words slightly in regards to what this is. You don't go church shopping. Here's what you do. If you were looking for a, for a community that you're going to be a part of, these are the two questions you ask. You say, does this spiritual leader... Show something in their life and the way they communicate about God that I'm willing to humble myself under their spiritual authority. Does this pastor, do they 
Do they live a life that I would humble myself and put myself under their spiritual authority and listen and invite them to speak into my life? Second question, let's look around and say, is this a community that I would be willing to open myself up to? Is this a community that I would be willing to know and let know me? Is this a community of people that I would be willing to serve and, and even let serve me, even as hard as that might be? That's what we're looking for in regards to a church. Not like shopping, what suits my needs best, but where can I be humble? Where can I be humble and where can I put myself in as part of this? God opposes the proud. But he says he gives grace to the humble. In fact, in this verse right here, if you read through it again, I always love circling as you read through. He literally says one after another for another three times in a row in two verses, humble, be humble, be humble. Because that, that is what defeats that pride the enemy has in our life. I'll wrap up with this. As he's wrapping up his letter, Peter says, I need you to understand there's an enemy. And he's getting ready to attack you. And let me tell you, the answer is the church. It's the church. I wonder if he wasn't thinking back to probably one of the hardest nights in his life. Because after that dinner that he had with Jesus, Jesus kind of told him, you know, man, stuff is, stuff is going to go sideways really fast here. And he looks at Peter and Jesus gives him a warning similar. Where like he's saying, like, I need to warn you about the devil. Jesus did the same thing to Peter on the night that he was going to be betrayed. And I love it. He says this in Luke twenty two thirty one. 31. He calls him Simon, which maybe that's even just in his mind. He pulls back to who you were before you even knew me, Peter. He says this, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you repented and you've turned to me again, Strengthen your brothers. Peter says to him, you know, Jesus, I, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to die for you. And in just a few minutes, Jesus says, no, actually, Peter, before sunrise tomorrow, you'll deny you even knew me three different times. But I love the word he speaks to him where he says, Peter, Satan is coming. He's trying to shake the faith out of you. It's another warning like that. Sift as wheat means to shake. You would shake the stuff out of him. He's like... Man, the devil's going to grab hold of you, Peter, in the next few hours, and he is just going to try to shake the faith out of you. But he says, I've already prayed, and I've already asked the, the Spirit to be faithful to pull you through. And I love what he says, though, on the backside of it. Did you notice that he says, when you've repented, go back and strengthen your brothers. Go back and be part of the church once again. Oh, you're going to mess up, Peter. But go back and find these same men you've walked with for the last few years and be part once again. And I wonder what it felt like for Peter to show up after that night and go back with his friends and say, yeah, man, I messed up. In my greatest moment where I could have stood up for Jesus, I ran away. I was too afraid of the culture that was trying to squash us. And perhaps the people around him welcomed back in and said, welcome back, Peter. Aren't we all struggling the same way that you are? Friends, you aren't meant to fit into this world. You aren't meant to fit in this culture. You are meant to be a foreigner, but you aren't meant to be alone. The world's culture is not your community, so you need a church. Let me finish by asking you this question. Are you a foreigner in our culture and a regular in the church? Or are you a regular in the culture and a foreigner in the church? Do you not fit into the culture? You're not really part of it, but when it comes to the church, you're a regular. You're known. You know. You serve. You're served. Or is it the opposite of way around? Are you a regular in the culture? You're known. You're part of it. You celebrate the same things. You just stay in that. But when it comes to the church, no one even knows your name. No one's serving you. You're not serving anybody. No one has opened their life to you. You haven't opened yours to anyone else. I need you to understand that this is the critical solution to the idea of actually living a life as a foreigner. 
For some of you today, this series has given you clarity. You've been struggling with this feeling of feeling like you're a foreigner. It's been hard for you. Maybe because you look around at what's been going on in our culture, you just feel like, I just don't fit in at all anymore. And, and you've been wondering if something's wrong with you. And the reality is, hopefully this series has reminded you, no, there's nothing wrong with you. This is how it's always been. In fact, he finishes this chapter with verse 12. He says this, what you were experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. And I hope that's a word for you. If you've been feeling like you're a for foreigner, that you would hear God just saying, this is how it's always been. This is how people have always felt if they've been Jesus followers. Stand in the grace of God inside of your community, inside of your church. But for some more of you, you've been feeling this tension of feeling like you don't fit in, but at the same time, you've remained a foreigner from the church. And you are not meant to live your life on your own. You are not meant to live your faith on your own. The devil has been trying to convince you to remain proud, to remain separated. I'll just take care of my faith on my own. I don't need a spiritual authority over me. No, I don't need to be part of this community. I don't need to open my life and be open. To, I don't need to serve people and be served by others. And listen to me, friend, that is a recipe for destruction. If you are going to actually live out this life as a foreigner, I pray that today the Holy Spirit would just break down that pride. If you don't have humility, you're not doing church. And it's the idea of humbling yourself and saying, I'm going to find somebody who I can put myself under spiritually, that I can follow after in this journey. I'm going to find a community that I can open myself up to, share the struggles I have, that I can use the spiritual gifts God's given me to serve them, and I'm going to let them serve me as well. And then one last part. I felt also as I was teaching this, there might be some people who are here and they've been coming and going from action. They've been here for a while as well. And you're a Jesus follower. I mean, you, you trust in Jesus. This isn't the word to somebody who's trying to figure out their faith. This is somebody who knows what they believe. They know what their faith is. But as you've been part of Acts, as you've been here and you've looked around, you think to yourself, these aren't my people. When you look out in the back, we have our seven core values and you read our core values, you think those aren't my values. Or when I talk about spiritual authority and you think of me as a pastor, you think Cameron isn't my spiritual authority. I wouldn't want him to be the person speaking into my life. I don't trust him that much. Then listen, be blessed and be somewhere else because you're missing the true opportunity of being part of a church. If this has just been your habit to be here, but you have no interest in opening your life to these people, if you have no interest in me being a spiritual authority to pastor you, to speak into your life, then go and find it. Go and find it somewhere else because that's not the church, just coming and sitting or disappearing and coming and going. You're meant to be known somewhere and you're meant to have a spiritual authority who actually knows your life and can pastor you. So if it's not here, then go be blessed somewhere else. But move beyond that. Would you do me a favor? Would you pray with me? Close your eyes for one second. God, I thank you so much for these people, and I thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would help some that the devil has been convincing to be proud. That today you would bring them a spirit of humility. They would realize they need to open their lives and you would help show them what those next steps are. Maybe it's coming early, staying late, talking to people, joining a team at our church so they can at least be part of something, know people, get to know people, being part of groups this fall and getting connected where they can actually open their lives up. Or maybe even it is just that step when we go to this fall and we talk about ownership of saying, I want to be part of this church and I want to invite the pastors to be able to speak into my life. And that you would just bring humility inside of us because I really do believe that's the antidote to what the devil has for our lives. I pray, God, that you would bring clarity on this subject, Lord, that we could live as a foreigner in this community, in this culture, but we would honor you with all of our days. In Jesus' name we pray. 